every week when I have to write a sermon or its main point, I feel the enormous responsibility to be at the level of who I represent and who will end up listening to me fundamentally. And particularly, there's a passage in the book of Ecclesiastes which applies to my work as a writer and communicator. In this case, Ecclesiastes 12.9 says, Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. So, the wise man imparted knowledge to the people. He said he pondered, he investigated, and he ordered the many proverbs, and he searched for the right words to convey the truth about him. But what most draws my attention is that the teacher adds, the words of the wise are like goads. <laughs> Like well-placed nails are his collections of sayings given by a single shepherd in a typical style of contradiction. He adds this final touch, saying, Besides them, my son, keep in mind that doing many books is endless and that much reading causes fatigue. As for writers or communicators and those who try to impart wisdom in a clumsy way, but we try at least, the teacher says there's a time to be goats and there's a time to be a well-placed nail. A stinger like those used by farmers with oxen prompts action. Stingers cause animals enough discomfort to do something that they probably wouldn't do otherwise. History gives us many examples of messages or sermons that have been like stingers, and they tend to shake the authorities of the day, of the present time. And there's a time to be a stinger, and there's a time to be a firmly buried nail. And although stingers prompt action, the nail, it sinks deeper in order to become an enduring mark, right? The nail typifies that message or that sermon that may not lead you to act immediately, but it leaves a permanent conviction in your soul. I remember hearing messages that were like stingers. They made me jump out of my seat, make a decision, and a commitment with God. Messages that were nails, that marked my way of thinking forever. They gave me new convictions. And communicators or preachers, we know that there's a time to be a goad and a time to be a nail. However, so that the aspiring preacher doesn't brag about himself, as very important, the teacher of Ecclesiastes adds with a sigh, I, I can imagine him going, oh, doing many books is endless. And that applies both for the writer and the speaker. Even the sharpest needles and the strongest nails are lost amid accumulations of words. That's my feeling. Every time I go online and listen to other preachers, or even when I review my own sermons, there are thousands and thousands of sermons circling in the immense ocean of information, and that without counting the millions of books. So, the hundreds of messages of how to help yourself. You know those help yourself books? They promise hundreds of new ways to save your marriage, to eliminate diseases, or how to succeed in business. Well, if these books really work, why are there so many books? The thing is, Jesus spoke with such economy and precision that most of his words can serve as both a thorn and it can also serve as a nail. Really, just think about it. However, the Gospels record only one moment in which he really wrote. 
todos, la mayoría conoce cuándo, ¿no? And Se everyone knows when I'm talking about. Tenso, This occurred in a tense moment when some Pharisees brought him a woman caught in the act of adultery demanding that he would decree the death penalty against her. Jesus didn't even answer them. He bent down, the scriptures say, and began to write in the sand. So the Son of God, who had participated in the design of the entire creation, who put the mountains in its place and the oceans in its causes, did not leave behind even a small note, not even a sticky note, written during his stay on earth so that we could read it a thousand times once and again. So, he wrote on the sand, and the next time it rained, it completely erased and it removed all traces of the only words that we know Jesus ever wrote. He didn't choose to write as a witness to his pen some piece of papyrus, which could have been preserved, and, I don't know, It could be considered as a relic. But he used a simple trowel made with sand from the Holy Land. I ask myself, why? I doubt that he didn't want to write. Without a doubt, he had the capacity to do it. Because, well, the goal of the teacher was to transform lives, to write words in the hearts of his followers. The Apostle Paul, following in his footsteps, he would say later on to the Corinthians, you yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by all. So, writing on the sand on behalf of the teacher was deliberate. I see it as a metaphor for the surface that he chooses to leave his mark, be it a stinger or a nail. Sand is so fallible. It's so fickle. It's so shaky. Fundamentally, ephemeral, that I don't think that there's anything that looks more like the heart of a human being. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, you yourselves are our letters, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. And he adds, you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry. Written, not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Incredible. Many times I've been confused by why God entrusted human beings like you, like me, full of defects, <laughs> with a task of communicating the good news. So, let me just say it this way. It's something I ask myself. Why did Jesus entrust such a task to people as weak as sand? I mean, wouldn't it have been better just to write some good volumes on paper? Wasn't it better so that Jesus would take advantage of the first 30 years of his life? before going into his public ministry in his free time just to write an autobiography, I don't know, encyclopedias? Wouldn't that have been better of what he knew, what he believed? Why do we, human beings, why do we have to bear the responsibility of being letters, like Paul says, known and read by all men? Really? Did he really think, the Lord, that that small group of disciples with whom he couldn't even trust sometimes were going to be able to fulfill the mission of the kingdom of God? And what about the present time? What about us? What chances does a church that we know, that church that you and I are part of, almost extinct in the Middle East, despised in secular Europe, a minority in great part of Asia and Africa, full of problems in America, have to change the world for the better? Look, I want to be brutally honest with you today. I want to be as brutally as honest as I can 
<laughs> more than last Sunday. Because that's what all this is about, right? I want to be as authentic as I can. I want to shorten the gap of what God wanted me to be when I was born and who I am today. That's why I'm trying to be authentic before you, all right? I have been a Christian for more than 40 years. I'm 52 years old, more than 40 years in this Christian life, and 33 years since the first time I spoke before a crowd, an audience, people. I was 19 years old the first time I started to preach. And during these years, by divine providence, I've been meeting a good number of preachers from around the world, right? I've been everywhere. I know all of my contemporary preachers. Some passed away to be with the Lord. Some are my age. Some are younger. But I've had the privilege and the honor to know most of them, at least the ones that are transmitting online, those who have mega churches, small churches. I've been around the world. I've been in many, many conferences around the world in every continent. And some of the people that I've known seem they were ready for anything except for spiritual leadership. <laughs> And among the best preachers, let me continue, hold on. I found myself with the most insecure types of people in the world. When they were off stage, when they didn't have a microphone in their hand. I know that some of them had many unresolved problems, overlapping traumas, serious personality disorders. They really had to go see a psychologist before getting behind a pulpit. And many others with a coercive complex with dictator syndrome from some type of weird country, ruling their congregations like if they were just, you know, people from a village, many believing their own press releases, listening only to those that talk good about them. I've seen others and known others ensuring a nepotism that keeps them in ministry for life. And finally, believe it or not, I look at myself in the mirror and then I see me. <laughs> and I realized that I have to have, of everything that I mentioned, a little bit of everything. Of all those syndromes, of all those weaknesses, I have a little bit of everything. Add it to other weaknesses that I'm not willing to confess here because we don't have the time. <laughs> and yet, I have to admit that some of the most outrageous characters that I have ever met who have a lot of ego and lack of fine finishing like this servant here are the ones who have achieved a lot in the kingdom. These are the team, the starters of the Lord's team. They organize relief efforts for the needy. I know it. They feed the hungry. They proclaim the good news. All that group of imperfect people that I just mentioned, some more or less, but everyone is imperfect, just like this servant here, were the ones who are working for the kingdom in a way that very few do. And that scheme is only a replica of something that the Bible shows us with great clarity. Think about it. You might say, the Bible is full of people like Jacob. God used Jacob with his untrustworthy ethics. David with his moral downfalls, free-falling. Jeremiah with his gloomy spirit, almost to a point of being considered bipolar. Saul of Tarsus with his past of abuses. We can see Peter with his notable failures. So once we start thinking about the Christian personalities that I've met in the past and those that appear in the Bible, I've come to the next principle. Like it or not, God uses whatever talents are available. Right? Look, no one who has ever been used by God has lived in pollute. It doesn't matter how much doctrine they might keep and without being broken in a way. Nevertheless, God has used them and us 
in a way to advance the cause of his kingdom. All those broken people, just like this servant that's talking to you right now. But let's put aside preachers because we're all saying, yeah, that's true, I know lots of preachers, but hold on. Let's think about the people that go to a regular church, any local regular church. Just imagine anyone. How about that guy over there who's not happy in his marriage, he can't get a job for a year and a half, but he receives people, he gives the welcome to the people because he does it for the Lord and he does it good. He's a failure as a father, as a husband, but there he is welcoming people inside his church with a big smile. How about that lady over there? We have a lady addicted to drama. <laughs> She saw way too many soap operas and she thinks her life is one. She starts to cry at the slightest thing because she feels that the devil has something against her. If her grandson doesn't visit her, it's the devil that's fighting against her. Oh, she has a good heart, but she loves drama. Her life is like a Mexican soap opera. Then you see the lawyer over there who practices his profession in a dubious way. <laughs> but not every lawyer is like that. I'm just talking about this one here. But he calms his conscience by faithfully bringing his tithe. Huh? Then you got the worship director, the worship leader, who is secretly addicted to pornography, and his life is as erratic as the way he directs the songs. According to how he feels, he'll praise or he will worship. And like always, even more incredulous, I look at myself in the mirror again, and I'm not different than them. So, I come to this conclusion, that the burden of the kingdom of God rests on the backs of ordinary, broken, and common pilgrims. And this commission hasn't been entrusted to angels nor spiritual giants, people. So why choose a plan that had all the odds against it? This is like writing a legacy on the sand. Hey, I wrote a very important book, but I wrote it on the sand. You're crazy. It's like putting a multinational company in the hands of a small group of six-year-olds. So to find an answer, I need to go back to the moment in which Jesus gave the commission to that group of followers. Jesus gives them a directive that we know as the Great Commission. Remember, in which he sends them to the ends of the earth. While the disciples are standing there trying to simulate all of that, the Lord rises up in the air to never be seen again. I can imagine Luke smiling when he describes years later that comical scene of 11 disciples just stretching their necks, right, like a duck to look at the clouds while angels ask him an obvious question. What are you doing here looking at the sky? That question implied, didn't he tell you to move? Well, then move. If Jesus had not ascended and would have stayed there forever here on earth in Jerusalem, the church would have no mistakes. Jesus was eternal. He had already resurrected. Imagine that Jesus would still be here today. There would be no broken people when moral issues such as euthanasia, abortion, gender inclusion arose, the church would have appealed directly to Jesus to dictate a rule that would clarify things once and for all. You know, when a priest has a doubt, they speak with a monsignor, and that monsignor can have access to the Pope. Well, imagine... Jesus is in the capital city, and you can go to him to ask any question concerning religion. Why would Jesus put his holy mission in the hands of people like us? <laughs> Why did he choose us as letters of Christ, written not with ink, words of Paul, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tablets of stone, but in tablets of the flesh of the heart? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm just sharing with you how I understand the trauma of the Bible, right, with my brand new wives, this child who survived in this adult body. 
I know, and forgive me if you're a scholar, a Bible scholar, but I know that the three people of the Godhead are present from the beginning to the end in scriptures. When God says, like, make man to our likeness and image, I know he's, talk, he's talking to the Trinity. But when I read the Bible, it's like a kind of work in three acts, right? The curtain closes twice to separate the three acts, the three moments. God the Father dominates the first act. I'm talking about Genesis to Malachi, where God dominates in the first act. You know how God intervenes all the time? I don't know. He takes Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. Then there's Noah, and there's Abraham, later Moses and David to free a tribe from slavery, to reward and punish kings, to send prophets with words to reproach and give hope to his people. I know God's in the first act. But then we have the second act where the center of attention is occupied by God the Son, the main theme of the four Gospels. So for the Jews, who had grown up with the stories about an unaccessible God who you could never go to see in the Holy of Holies except you were the high priest, but the very idea that a Galileo made such extravagant statements like, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That was too much. That was too strong. That's why they sent him to the cross. We never saw God, but this Galilean comes and says, whoever sees him sees God. So that second act has Jesus as the main actor. And with a Pentecost, in the book of Acts, we start the third act in which the star is now the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in human agents. Remember, Jesus says, it's better for you that I would go. Jesus assured his disciples before his arrest. When the Comforter comes, who I will send from the Father, the Spirit of truth that proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me, and you too will be witnesses. So, this is very interesting to try to understand what I was talking about. Seen through the lens of this three-act work, it's like in the first act, it would seem like God the Father was handling the human history, or at least the Israelites. Right? He was aware of everything. He would feed them in the desert, give them water through a rock. Just like the scriptures say, he would take Israel through the wilderness as a father takes his son. In the second act, the disciples asked Jesus if he had the power to heal the sick, raise the dead, and even calm a storm. Why not use that power on a much larger scale? Why don't you use your power in a bigger stage to do other things. In other words, since you're here in the second act, why not go against Rome? Why not sit in the place of Caesar and rule instead of going to heaven, leaving everything in the hands of people like us? Why not stay here and reign here? That's not a crazy idea. But they didn't realize that Jesus had rejected that option from the beginning of his ministry. When he had refused to accept the magic solution that Satan offered him in the desert. Listen to this. If Jesus had the power to heal diseases and to raise the dead, the question is, that's what I would ask Jesus if he were here with me in person. Year 2021. If you had the power to heal the sick and everything, why don't you go to every hospital to heal everyone from COVID-19? Why, why don't you deal with the macro problems such as earthquakes, hurricanes, and every virus that comes from bats, China, or wherever they're going to they're gonna come from that plague the earth? Theologians, they attribute many of the earth's illnesses to the consequences of human freedom. What we live is in a fallen world, and this leads us to other questions. Let's think together, all right? Do we really enjoy too much freedom? We're free to harm and to kill each other, to unleash world wars, to plunder our planet, 
to leave the forest without trees, contaminate rivers, even. We're free to defy God, to challenge God, to live without restrictions. If there were no existence of heaven or hell, people say, I'm going to live my life here as I want to here, and I don't care about that. And we can. We're free for that, at least to make that decision. I mean, Jesus could have at least devised some irrefutable proof to silence all atheists and unbelievers, but he did it. The first official act of Jesus as an adult, all this is just to build what I want you to know what God put in my heart for you. The first official act of Jesus as an adult, as a Messiah, was when he went to meet face-to-face -face with the accuser who gave him the opportunity to confront these problems of world problems and what the disciples would, let, would later ask him. Satan, Satan himself, in person, tempted the Son of God to change the rules of the game and to achieve his purpose with a more direct method. He was proposing to be a better meth, a better Messiah than what Jesus had planned. In the sandy plains of Palestine, more than the character of Jesus was at stake. What was at stake was human freedom. Everything happened there in that desert. In the garden, Many years before, a man and a woman had fallen before Satan's promise that they would be able to reach a higher state than the one assigned it to them. Millennials later, the second Adam, Jesus, according to the expression of Paul, he was faced with a similar test, though curiously inverted. Listen, the serpent in Eden asked Adam and Eve, you can be like gods. In the desert, Satan says to Jesus, are you sure you want to be human? Because you, you might not be sure about wanting to be a human being, completely human. When I read the account of the temptation, it occurs to me that for the lack of eyewitnesses, all the details had to be provided by Jesus himself. There was no one there with him taking note or just a gossip. There were no paparazzi. For some reason, Jesus felt obligated to discover before his disciples that moment of struggle and personal weakness. The same tempter who had found a point of vulnerability in Adam and Eve struck Jesus with a deadly precision. And Luke sets the stage with a dramatic tone. Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days. And he was tempted by the devil. And he adds, and he did not eat anything in those days, after which he was hungry. So, I want you to go with me to that time, that sandy place in Palestine. Two giants of the cosmos came to a desolate scene. Two warriors ready for combat, like two boxers, right? Spinning around each other, measuring each other in the ring. Huh? One who had just started his mission in enemy territory, in a hostile territory. The other on a familiar ground, but was the one who struck first the blow. Satan asked Jesus to turn a stone into bread, remember? And he offered him all the kingdoms of the world, and then he prompted him to jump down from a great height to test God's promise of his physical safety. Let's go by this, piece after piece. Where is there something bad in this request? Because the three temptations, they seem the same qualities that would be expected from a Messiah. I mean, wasn't Jesus going to multiply loaves of bread for 5,000 people, a much more impressive demonstration than what Satan was offering him? Jesus was going to triumph over death and raise again to become king of kings. So the three temptations don't seem bad in themselves. And yet, 
something fundamental happened in the desert. Although Satan established the test, in the end, it was him who did not pass the test. In the first two tests, he asked Jesus to prove who he is. In the third, the third temptation, he wants worship, adoration. The first two have to show who he is, and the third one, worship. So temptation unmasked Satan, but God remained being the same. If you are God, Satan said, surprise me and act as God should act. Jesus answered, only God decides these things. Therefore, I am not going to do anything just because you ask me to. So when I see the temptations, I see that Satan proposed an attractive improvement for the mission of the Messiah. He tempted Jesus with the good parts of the human being without the bad, savoring the taste of bread without being subjected to the fixed rules of hunger and agriculture. Think about that. Why do you have to sow and reap? Why do you have to get dope? Just transform stones into bread. Facing risk without danger, enjoying fame without power, without the prospect of pain. Satan, in the ring, in that desert, proposed Jesus to wear a crown but not a cross. And that temptation that Jesus resisted is the one that many of us today, his followers, sometimes cannot resist. The Messiah did not use his miraculous powers for his own benefit. From the very moment of the temptation, Jesus was reluctant to force a rule to the universe. Now, imagine how easily it would have been for Jesus to transform those stones into bread, like he later turned water into wine at the party in the wedding of Can of Galilee. After all, why not? He was hungry. He finished fasting. Plus, the Roman authorities gave free bread to promote Caesar's kingdom. Jesus could have done the same to promote his. He would have started there. Of course, Satan. All this is going to be a bakery in the desert. Imagine, just say yes to the devil in order to build Christianity, not on the basis of four weak gospels and a defeated man nailed to a cross, but on the basis of sound planning and self-help principles. Instead of writing the Great Commission on the quicksand of broken men, he could have written it on the rock of his own power. If he had not given us the opportunity, us, and he would have changed the rules of the game in the desert, he today would be acclaimed equally at the London School of Economics, I don't know, Harvard Business Administration Schools, Jesus would have a statue in the Parliament Square, another one in the Kremlin. <laughs> First of all, in those sands of Palestine, it was being decided what the Messiah would be like. He was about to start his ministry. Satan says, what are you going to do? Are you going to be a Messiah of the people with an air of socialism? Are you going to turn the stones into bread to feed the multitudes? Are you going to be a Messiah of the Torah, standing majestically on the pinnacle of the temple? a Messiah king who would rule not only over Israel but over all the kingdoms of the earth that I can offer you? In summary, Satan offered Jesus the opportunity to be the Messiah, to be the Messiah that everyone wants Jesus to be today. What we spoke last Sunday, 2,000 years have passed by and we're still praying for a Messiah that makes governments be upright, impartial, stop promoting laws that offend us. We don't want a suffering Messiah. And Jesus didn't want to enjoy knowing he was going to go to the cross. Satan suggested Jesus to throw himself from the highest point to test God's care. 
And that temptation would reappear during his ministry, time and time again. Remember when Jesus spoke that he should go to the cross and Satan once again was in the conversation using Peter? Jesus had to rebuke Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan, because he recognized it wasn't Peter, but Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You don't set your sight on the things of God, but those things of men. And Peter, poor guy, he might have been thinking, what did I say? I received an exhortation. I wanted to take care of him. Peter had been horrified by the prediction that Jesus was going to suffer and was going to die. And Peter says, in no way will this happen to you. And that instinctive reaction of Peter had touched a very delicate point in Jesus. Because Jesus, in Peter's words, well-intentioned or not, he heard once again the traction of Satan tempting him to take an easier path. Don't suffer. No need to. You're God. Let them suffer, not you. That temptation was going to continue because nailed to the cross, Jesus would hear someone repeat in a mocking way that last and casually the same consequent temptation. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. That was Satan through a criminal who never stopped tending him from the desert. Save yourself. Make a big show here. Don't die. And the spectators repeated the cry. Make him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. What a way of preaching. Imagine that. Him coming down from the cross, wings appearing, or he started to fly away. But there was no rescue, no miracle, no easy path, or no life without pain. For Jesus to save others, he couldn't save himself. And Satan proposed Jesus a quick way to fulfill his mission. He could win over the multitudes, offering food or whatever they wanted, assume control of the kingdoms of the world, and protect himself from any danger. With five, six bodyguards, angels, archangels, it's it, it's over. But you can't preach or extend a kingdom from power, but from love, from free choice. Right? I remember many years ago, I read that an editor-in-chief wrote, a major Russian newspaper, it said, we don't know how to motivate people to be compassionate, the editor-in-chief said. We want to try to generate funds for the children of Chernobyl, but the common Russian citizen prefers to spend their money in alcohol, in wine, or what is it that they drink? I don't remember. In beer or whatever, vodka. How can we reform and motivate people? This editor was asking, how can we make people be good people? 74 years of communism had shown that goodness could not be legislated from the Kremlin and forced at gunpoint. There was no way. We spoke about this last Sunday. And God keeps on talking about this. It's because we need to continue to understand. Attempts to compel morality often produce defiant people and triant rulers who lose their moral sense. That's why I always remember, it's another kingdom, stupid. I remind myself. I have to say it over and over. Stick it on the fridge. It's another kingdom, stupid. I'm thinking about tattooing it on my forehead. It's a different kingdom, stupid. We have to relearn the fundamental lesson of the temptation. Kindness cannot be imposed from the outside, from the top down. It has to be developed internally, from the bottom upward. The temptation in the desert reveals a profound difference between the power of God and the power of Satan. The devil has a power to coerce, to force obedience, to destroy. Humans, we've learned a lot from that power, and governments draw a lot from that deposit. 
con un látigo, con with a whip, aroma, con gas tear gas, o con una or with an AK-47. Human beings can force another human being to do almost anything they want. The power of Satan is external and forceful. The power of God is, on the contrary, internal, and it's not forceful. The Lord never wanted to enslave anyone, not even with miracles. Come, and I will feed you. No. At least, not bread, natural bread. He spoke of a water to which people would never be thirsty again, a bread of life. But he never wanted faith to be tied to miracles, but it should be given to us freely. Not founded on miracles, God became weak for a purpose, to allow human beings to choose freely for themselves regarding Him. Look, I said I was going to be brutally honest with you. Sometimes I have to confess, I wish God would use a stronger touch in some things, not only in the world, but with me, to act stronger. I don't doubt in His power, But wouldn't it be easier, at least I think so, for my spiritual life, for me it would be easy if I would wake up in the morning and God would say, Dante, don't do this, don't do that, take another way, there's going to be an accident, and you're going to get there late at work. Don't eat that tomato, it's not organic, be careful with that wine, it's not Mendoza Malbec, it doesn't taste the same. You know, many people believe that's the gospel. Lord, what color of underwear should I put it on? Guide me, Father, guide me. Pink or blue? And they think that God's forced to tell them. We wish we wouldn't commit mistakes that way. But my faith suffers because of my too much freedom, my temptations. Sometimes I would like God to overwhelm me, to overcome my doubts with certainty, to give me definite proof of His existence, that He loves me. Come on, control me like a puppet. I want it. But it doesn't work like that. God respects my freedom. I would love God to have a more active role in human beings. If God would have extended his hand right to the throne, Saddam Hussein, how many lives would have been saved in the Gulf War? Why didn't God make, I don't know, Osama bin Laden get a virus when he was a kid and never be born or I don't know and never throw down the Twin Towers? If God had done the same with Hitler, how many Jews would have been saved? Why does God stay still? <laughs> I would like to have God stuck in the lamp that I can rub every morning and him to appear. Tell me, your wish is my demand. Today, Monday, I want the Democrats not to win the elections. I want Maduro to leave the power in Venezuela. I want Cuba to be free. Um, that all who defend abortion would be ashamed, that Argentina would win the next World Cup, and Messi to take the World Cup trophy. Amen. That's Monday only. <laughs> you laugh, but you have no idea the prayers that many Christians make during soccer championships. Really? No, oh, we're praying, we're praying. Our country deserves it. Really? It's a different kingdom, stupid. I say to myself. <laughs> I even heard some people say the Argentinian team won't win because most of them are inclined to idolatry. But Brazilians, they're going to win more because they pray to God and there are lots of Christians on their team. Do you think that God's really looking at soccer matches? You see why we're supposed to stick on our forehead? It's a different kingdom, stupid. I would also like God to take a more active role in my personal life. I like quick answers and spectacular answers to my prayers, healing for my diseases, protection, safety, you know, like a medical insurance. You know, when you have medical insurance, you know everything you can, where you can go, all the assistance you have. Well, I want that with God. Pray every morning and never get sick of COVID. Not even me or those that work under my covering. Amen. <laughs> When I think of these terms, I see in myself a resounding echo of the challenge that Satan threw at Jesus 2,000 years ago. It's the same. God resists those temptations now as Jesus had to resist them on earth, and he opts for a slower and more discreet way. 
He prefers to write the extension of his gospel on the sand, on us. Instead of crushing evil with his divine force and power, instead of imposing justice and destroying the unjust, instead of establishing peace through perfect earthly government, he chooses to trust the third act to use broken people, filling them with his Holy Spirit. Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, Jesus said. How many times have I wanted to gather your children like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you did not want to. Remember when Jesus cried saying, I wanted to protect you like a hen? The disciples said, they're all crazy. The disciples proposed Jesus to send a fire on the atheist cities. Jesus did not want to impose himself on those who were not willing. Remember when it said, and he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Matthew 13, 58. What a gentleman. When he went to the gatherings, he set the demon-possessed man free. They kicked him out and Jesus left. He didn't say, no one's going to kick me out. Do you know who I am? No. The quality that most makes me fall in love with God, you know what it is? It's everything that he could do, but decides not to. <laughs> Fascinating. God's insistence on human freedom is so absolute that he gave us power to live as if he did not exist, to spit on his face, to crucify him. Jesus had to know all that beforehand when he had to face the tempter in the wilderness. Why didn't he kill Satan there? Why didn't he just cast him into the lake of fire and it's all over? God insists on restraining himself because no pyrotechnic display of omnipotence would get the answer he wants. Because after every miracle crusade of every evangelist around the world, millions would have already known Christ. But people don't believe in miracles and they don't believe in Christ through miracles. Because although obedience can be forced, only love can produce response of love. And that's what God wants from us and that's the reason why he created us. God's nature of God is to give himself. His call is based on a sacrifice of love. I always remember my mom who never stopped talking and praying for one of her sons. She would call him the prodigal son, Daniel. She said, he's my best son. Daniel had known the Lord, but then he ended up getting divorced. He backslided from the Lord. He became an alcoholic. And my mother, she felt helpless. And with words not unlike those used by Jesus about Jerusalem, saying, oh, I want to be like the hen to protect you, chicks. Well, my mom would say, oh, if only Danny would come back to the ways of the Lord so that God would show him how much we love him. She said, I miss him, even though he doesn't want to know anything about God. I feel a love for Daniel that means more to me than for the love that I have for my other three sons who are in the Lord. Of course, I felt like the older brother of the prodigal son. I've been going to church ever since I was a kid in those boring, long church services, and the one that she loves the most is the one who's out gambling. Weird, but that's love. And I feel, she said, that's the way love is. That's the way a mother's love is. <sighs> and I feel that last sentence of my mom, I feel more perception of the mystery of how God operates than what I could find in any book of theology. That's love. God looks and says, that's love. Really? You're going to trust the gospel in Peter and these guys in Thomas? Oh. Ah. That's my Danny. I love him. Love has its own power. 
The only power capable of conquering a human heart. Look, Jesus was going to cast out many demons, but the spirit that replaced them was much less possessive and always depended on the will of the one who had been possessed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus could say, I'll cast out this spirit and I'll give you my spirit. But he said, no. Even like this, I ask myself this question. Is human freedom worth it? Because, come on, it's hard. For the Lord, and seeing how he preserved free will, I believe he tells us, yes, it's worth it. And when I go back to the rest of Jesus' life, I see that the pattern of restraining that he started in the wilderness persisted throughout his entire life. Never, never in all these years as a Christian have I seen Jesus force someone's hand. We do it. If anyone raises their hand, a friend or an usher will come near you, take your information, ask for your ID, a picture, we'll call you four times a week, we'll drive you crazy, not Jesus. We call it the follow-up ministry so people won't escape. But Jesus leaves the consequences of the decision very clear. He allows other people to decide. He answered a rich man's question with a firm word, and he let him walk away. Hey, Mark, did you get his cell phone? Look, I know he can give a good tithe. Explain the parable better. No, he let him walk away. Then Mark intentionally adds this comment. Then Jesus, looking at him, he loved him. He loved him and said, Go, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven. And come follow me, taking up your cross. We miss that detail. Oh, you see, rich are not going to come in. We miss that detail of Jesus looking at him and loving him. He never gave up the idea of how does this obnoxious guy dare to follow me with all the money he has? No, he loved him. And because he loved him, he let him decide. Because he loved him too much, he let him decide for himself. Jesus had a realistic vision of how the world would respond to him. Because of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. He never said, I'll warm them up. Nope. Let them grow cold. Sometimes we use the term, the messianic complex, huh? to describe that syndrome of obsession the preachers have wanting to resolve everyone's problem. But the true Savior, he was extraordinarily free from that complex. I don't see the real Savior who felt obligated to convert everyone during his life or to heal people who weren't ready to be healed or marching around seven times Herod's palace or laying hands on Pilate's throne. Look, he didn't even exhort people for not having faith. He would ask, what do you want me to do for you? He asked a blind man, what do you want? Because maybe the blind man didn't want to recover his eyesight. Maybe he wanted a white cane. Jesus asked, do you want to be healed? Jesus showed incredible respect for human freedom up to this day. When Satan asked to tempt Peter and pass him through, right, and to shake him like wheat, Jesus never refused the request. He said, Peter, I have prayed so that your faith won't fail you. Why didn't he say, your mama, I rebuke you, devil. I rebuke you. Get away from him. You're not going to touch Peter. No. Go. I'll pray for Peter's faith not to fail him. You see, when the crowds went away and many disciples abandoned him, Jesus said to the 12, hey, do you want to go too? Huh? To, do you two want to go? What do you mean, follow up? You know when you miss out on church and usher says, you didn't come last Sunday, huh? We had to stay here, but you didn't come. Oh, I'm going to tell our leader. He said to his disciples, you want to leave? Leave. He unmasked Judas, but he didn't try to prevent his wrongdoing. 
Tell me if you can find a sentence that has love like this one. What you decided to do, do it soon. You see how Jesus was a gentleman even with Judas? Is there a phrase that can contain more love than that? Where he says to Judas, what you're going to do, do it soon? Why didn't he stop them? Why didn't the other 11 beat him up, rebuke him? I don't know, until he changed. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. And the least manipulative invitation you have ever seen or heard. Jesus could have said, whoever comes to me. We'll have a business. You will be a businessman. How many want to be head and not tell? Who comes to me, I will heal. Who comes to me will not get sick if you're under my coverage. Jesus never promised what we promised. He said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and walk. You know why I'm say I'm a legalistic pastor in recovering? Because every now and then, I expect and I hope that Jesus would have the same qualities with which I grew up in my church. I was in a church where I felt a victim of emotional pressure. If the pastor prayed for me and I didn't fall, he pushed me. If not, the usher would throw you down. And if I wouldn't fall, they would pray against my rebellion to the anointing. The doctrine was presented in the style of believe in this and ask no questions. So the power of miracles, plus respecting authority, the church left no room for doubts. And then I grew up, got more mature, and I understood the manipulative techniques to win souls, which some involved presenting myself to the person with whom I was speaking to just present the gospel. And if I had not presented the gospel at the end of the talk, having approached that person served for nothing. Up to this day, there are people who think this way. I spoke about this. You know, like the store clerk syndrome? When people say, can I help you in something? They don't want to help you in something. They want to sell you something. To believe that an employee is coming near you to help you is a mistake. And people perceive when we don't have genuine love for them. Sometimes, when I have to interview someone on CNN, they write to me accusing me, saying, I suppose you told Pepe Mujica about Christ, otherwise I don't understand the purpose of that interview. Really? Maybe the guy can sense that I'm truly genuine with him. I'm not accusing him. People know that if later on we're going to have a friendship or not. That manipulating power is not from Jesus. I go to Jesus' life and I don't find those qualities. And if we read the story of the church, many followers have succumbed to the same temptations he resisted. To our shame. The history of the church reveals tireless attempts to improve the way to the Messiah, make it better, to bring more people in. Sometimes, even the church dreams of pardoning with the government because it offers a shortcut to power and it confuses the two kingdoms. We spoke about this last Sunday. Sometimes, the church cultivates its own dictators. The most dangerous was Jim Jones. Remember, in the 80s, he poisoned everyone. David Koresh. He burned everyone because they understood how to manipulate power. And others, they might not kill their followers, but they suffocate their souls, telling them what they can and cannot do, how to dress, what church to go, what music to listen, with whom they should marry. They're people who don't marry the person they love if the leader doesn't approve it. I have no congregation whose members have to ask for a letter of permission signed by the pastor if they want to visit a different church. We have to see if we're going to give it to you. Otherwise, you're in rebellion and you won't serve anymore. So sometimes the church simply borrows the instruments of manipulation that politicians have perfected. When someone thinks that I'm criticizing everyone, no, 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 no. I just look at the mirror and I realize that the church is like that because it's made up of people like me. I didn't say like you. I said like me. 
<laughs> and I lack the willpower to resist quick fixes for human needs. I lack the patience to allow God to act in a slow in a kind way. I want to force changes in people. I wish to control situations, to force others to believe in the causes that I believe in, like what happened in our countries. Those who defended their lives hated those who were in favor of abortion. You can see it all the time. I've seen it on the social media. They're all going to hell if you're for abortion. They would curse them so much, which was worse than what the other group was trying to defend. We've seen it. If a non-Christian artist would go to church, I would feel frustrated if at the end of the service they didn't run to the altar call. I feel that if someone came to the service, was respectful, but then left and didn't come up running to the altar call, I'm thinking maybe we needed to manipulate him more to make him believe in what we believe. There's the famous evangelical phrase, what a pity, what a shame. You didn't take advantage of the opportunity to preach the gospel. Yeah, they invited us to talk about economy. We believe that we're obligated to take advantage of the moment, but then they're never going to invite us again. They're going to close the doors on us. That's why Christians are no longer sources of consultation in matters of wisdom before society. Instead of being interested in reflecting Christ and talking about economy, giving an example in a kind way, letting our light shine through our expressions without hatred. No, we take advantage of all the little doors to open to exercise power. And when I feel that these temptations arise within me, I go back to when Jesus and Satan were in the wilderness. And I ask for the same confidence and patience that Jesus showed, and I'm glad just like Hebrew says, that we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tempted in everything according to our likeness, but without sin. And as much as he himself suffered being tempted, he is powerful to help those who are tempted. So, I go back <laughs> to the first letters written in the sand, the first disciples. What are you doing here looking at the sky, the angel said. It's like saying, move, now you're the stars of the third act. And even though in three years Jesus managed to change history forever, while he was on earth, he did nothing for China. Jesus did nothing for Australia, America, or even Europe when he was here on earth. That would come later through the work of his followers. He was a gentleman. He was wise and prudent. He had patience. Just like I said last Sunday, something small that grows like a mustard seed or just like a little bit of yeast inside the dough. Jesus had told them in words whose meaning they would hardly understand and assimilate that at that time. He who believes in me and the works that I do, he will also do them. And he will make them even greater because I'm returning to the Father. So we clumsy, broken pr pilgrims were the Jesus that left behind after the ascension, the heirs of the Spirit of God. Paul takes this concept even further by stating that we are the body of Christ, the temple of God, which means the real presence of God in the world. My friend, we are the reason why Jesus came to launch a kingdom without borders that would end up reaching Europe, China, Australia, and the American continent. Where is God today in the world? Everywhere. The third act, in the most risky of all turns of the work, has delivered God in us and through us. And what we do for the little ones, we do it for Him, He says. So when I say to the Lord, help me, I need your help, I feel like God says, I need your help too. 
I too need your help. So, go give that old lady from Colombia some water, I'll honor her, and then I'll think about what I'm going to do with your problems. For now, assist my children, because you're doing it for me. To form the planet, God used glaciers, floods, shifts of tectonic plates, volcanic eruptions, genes, DNA sequences. All these things played a role in sharpening the planet we inhabit. After, God assigned the administration of that planet to the only species that he made in his image. Jesus commissioned human agents. He delegated to us the task of spreading the message of the good news of God's love, a message that doesn't only include words but also acts, deeds. God has assigned notoriously the fallible human beings the holy task of bringing the good news and liberation to the world. So people, were the letters of the Lord written in sand for about 80 to 90 years, if we get to live that long, God must have known the risk involved in the decision to entrust a mission of this caliber to human beings as incapable as you and me. You know why you don't like pastors? Because they're like you. But they have a little bit more power. You know why you don't like that church? I'm not going to go to that church anymore. Because they have imperfect people like you and me. If there were a perfect church, beloved Juan Carlos Ortiz would say, you would have ruined it because you arrived. It was perfect, and then you came, and now it's imperfect. <laughs> and several of his epistles, Paul, Paul speaks of our adoption as sons and daughters of the Lord, sons and daughters of God. A father stands behind the fence and watches his son play like Messi. Or a mother receives a phone call letting her know that her daughter was accepted into medical school. How do you think they react? What does a father say who watches his son play? Ha! Huh. That boy is trying to be a show-off. I'm going to break his leg when he gets home so he'll learn to be humble. What does a mother say when she receives a phone call? That daughter thinks she's very smart because she's going to go to college. I'm going to disconnect her computer so she can learn. Of course not. You know what the father says? You see that girl? That's my son. That's my son. What does a mother say? They accepted my daughter. She's going to be a doctor. Somehow, ordinary people have the ability to make the God of the universe feel like a proud father or mother. God likes me. And God likes you too. You have no idea how much he loves you. You know why God blesses me so much? Because it just blesses him. Because I don't lose the ability of being amazed every door God opens. I'm like, really? For me? Does that happen to you like a father? You know, what better gift than seeing the face of your child when they open a present or a gift? Who's happier? The kid then half an hour forgets about the toy or you when you see his face? Oh, you bought this for me. So at the end of the day, I ask myself this question. What did I do to make God happy? Well, I review my interactions with my neighbors, the way I handled some unwanted phone call, my way of using money and time. Did I please God in everything, as Paul asked when he prayed for the Colossians? Look, listen to this. When I read the accounts of the New Testament church, the characteristic that stands out the most is diversity, the main testing ground of grace. From Pentecost, the church dismantled the barriers of sex, race, social class that had marked Jewish congregations. Paul, who had given thanks for not being born a woman, today they would kill him for that. Today, the Me Too movement, the inclusive language movement, they would kill him for saying such a thing like that. 
Imagine it. But he was marveled. And he said, there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, man or woman. All of you are one in Christ. Ah, how about that? Diversity complicates life. And perhaps that's the reason why we tend to find churches that are like us, they would have the same doctrine, share our ideas. But the church, the church offers a place where both babies and grandparents, employed and undocumented immigrants, can meet. And that's why I maintain the everyone or no one. That's River Church. That's why when the pandemic started, I told California's governor, Newsom, all right, it's closed until the virus goes away. But don't obligate us to leave the elderly outside, children outside, to not let the sick inside. We're a family. No one takes a grandmother outside because she's old and can't come in. Or the little kid has a runny nose, you can't come in. Come on, we're a family. And because I don't want to go against the law or the norms, everyone or no one, no one for now. When I go to a new church, the more the members resemble each other, the more uncomfortable I feel. It makes me feel uncomfortable. When I see people in a church dressed the same, everyone with shawls on their head, when I look at the women, they all look the same. They all have the same hairstyle. They all have the same long skirts. They all look like nuns. It's scary. It's very close to becoming a sect. At any moment, they're going to be far away from everyone to not contaminate themselves with the world. Nevertheless, diversity is only successful in a group of people who share a common vision. In Jesus' prayer in John 17, Jesus highlighted a request above others. May they all be one, he said. Not uniformity, one. So Paul, he calls for unity to stop the divisions in his epistles. The existence of so many dominations in the world shows that Christians have not achieved that goal. If there were great divisions due to questions on how communion is supposed to be served, some people think, how can you drink small individual cups? It should be one big cup. And because of this, so the way that people dress or any dumb reason, we're divided. It's really childish if you think about it. It's superficial. We haven't been faithful, faithful stewards of God's grace. To be a faithful steward of God's grace means to love each other, forgive each other, pray for each other, carry each other's burdens, be loyal to each other, consider each other as more important than ourselves, do not speak against each other, imagine, don't judge each other, be tolerant with each other. Be kind to each other. Speak the truth to each other. Edify each other. Comfort each other. Take care of each other. I wonder how different the church would look like before a world that observes if Christians had followed that model everywhere. Now, I've traveled around the world. I never found a perfect church. It doesn't exist. We shouldn't expect to find one either. I've gone to churches where some of them made me sleep. From the pastor to the musicians, they all wanted to go home before beginning. And others tried so hard to be powerful that they thought they had to shout out loud. Otherwise, there's no power or anointing. You know, right now, ha! Ah, and they think if they're not shouting, there's no anointing. They use the Bible, God shouts today. And when I was tempted to judge, you know what I remembered? I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, yeah, the church is just an experiment of God. How can I pretend perfection inside a church? It's like trying to expect health inside a hospital. Right? Same people in a madhouse. It's not going to work. God allow ordinary human beings like us to embody his presence on earth. We are letters written and fallible human sand. 
You know how sometimes you buy a bottle just by its cover, by the way it looks, but the taste is horrible? <laughs> right? I heard a preacher not too long ago, well, a couple of years ago, and he said, how would you react if you call for a pizza and they bring it to you without a box? The delivery guy brings it with his hands. You'd get angry and call and want another one. But when it's inside the box, it's different. Now, how much is a box worth? Nothing. What? Only cents? What gives value to the, to the box? What's inside? The Lord is all backwards than what we think marketing is. How many times have you said, Wow, look how great this can of whatever, this bottle of this wine, and when you taste it, it's horrible. But it has an incredible marketing. We voted people like that. In Argentina, an entire country voted for a president who presented himself saying, huh, they say I'm boring. Boring. I'll show you what having fun is. And everyone voted for him because of what he said, his marketing. Now, the way he governed is something different. Precisely, the gospel is all backwards. The gospel is against marketing. Where treasures and earthly vessels were written letters in the fallible human sand. And he chose us knowing what we were. One day Jesus saw Simon and Andrew fishing and he invited them to be disciples and they followed him. And then he saw Jacob and John, and they also followed him. And it wasn't weird or unusual for rabbis to have disciples, because a man couldn't be a rabbi without disciples. Right? That was leadership. Right? A leader without anyone following them is just taking a walk. What was unusual was that Jesus recluded them, because it was customary for the disciples to initiate the application process. And the fact that this rabbi took the first step could have looked like he was desperate because Harvard isn't looking for students out in the streets. But Jesus did this to reflect a principle. The calling begins in God. And that band of disciples of Jesus stayed together for three years. They traveled, they learned, they prayed together. They saw Jesus cry, get tired, laugh. And when... The time came, they committed mistakes. And also, at some times, they did what was right. Sometimes I think that Jesus could have ministered much more easily without them. <laughs> no wonder Jesus had to say, up till when do I have to put up with you? But then, after Jesus died, there was a chance that group would disband, but they continued. They were teaching later on in the temple. The Bible tells us that the Sanhedrin called them to interrogate them. Imagine that. Two fishermen interrogated by the intellectual elite would be like two fishermen having to answer questions before teachers of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. But it was the faculty of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that ended up with their mouths wide open. These two fishermen were people without study or training, but they recognized they had been with Jesus. They followed Jesus. It was an alternative community. They prayed, they served, and they shared food with joy and generosity. They would lay their possessions available to others to help each other. They understood they had a mission. And when persecution arose, do you think they started to cry? They took it as a way to spread the word. Hey, I'm going to run away to Europe, but then I'll preach there. Rome and the ancient nations in general didn't know what to do with this movement. Nothing had ever been like this before. In this new nature, there's no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, educated or uneducated, slave or free, but Christ is everything and in everyone. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Where did the idea of a united world come from? From people from all genders, all nationalities, all positions, 
Look at everyone in the live chat. They're from everywhere around the world. Where before Jesus was there a moment they actively sought to include every human being, regardless of their nationality, ethnicity, status, to be transformed and loved. It was Jesus' idea, and it's happening now. While the magistrates competed in their love for honor, Christians called that van of glory. Christians gave offerings to pagans, and the rich never did this. Most of the religious groups segregated their memberships by sex, but Christians included men and women equally. In the Greek world, slaves were generally excluded from these pagan groups, but Christians admitted slaves and pagan masters. And at the end of the time they spent with Jesus, they didn't cause a great national impact. When Jesus ascended, and we would have been there, we would have seen the Roman Empire with its 500,000 kilometers of roads, its extension to Asia, Africa, Europe, its history of domination, its social status, the envy of the Mediterranean. And then we would have observed these few failed, terrified, defeated people, ex-followers of an executed carpenter. If someone had raised a bet on that group and would have said, who do you think is going to exist 2,000 years later? <laughs> All the money would have gone in favor of Rome, the empire, which today is as extinct as the dinosaurs. It's true that the next rain that fell completely removed all traces of the only words that we know that Jesus once wrote. But you want me to tell you what's so wonderful about this story? That he continues to write over and over again on the human sand. He writes about people as strange as you or me. The great writer didn't choose as a witness of his pen on some piece of papyrus which we could have preserved or used as a relic. He just used a simple pallet made with sand from the Holy Land. That's what we were, that's what we are, and that's what we'll all be. Letters on the sand. Father, thank you for the wonderful people that you love so much. How the Lord loves you. How could the Lord not love you if he has wrote upon your life the Great Commission? There's not one day, and this is true, it's not false modesty, that I don't want to present my resignation before the Lord. Every week I say, I don't have what it takes. I'm not the indicated one. I have no preparation. But the Lord says, it's a treasure and an earthly vessel. That's why you're here. It's precisely for that, because I will be glorified in your life, the Lord says because you're sand. Look, you might be able to live 80, 90 years at most, but upon this sand, the Lord will write his story today. And on that sand, he writes his story in your heart. I pray for every mom, dad, for the pastors, for the servers, for this crib of champions that are watching from everywhere around the world. The Lord loves you. If you're here for the first time listening and you're Catholic, atheist, an unbeliever, a Muslim, a Jew, whatever you are, the Lord loves you. And I'm not telling you you have to change your religion or your beliefs. I'm just telling you that the Lord respects you, that the Lord chooses to respect your freedom of choice but receive him in your heart. And he is like a gentleman. He will come in. He will dine with you and you will dine with him. The Lord loves you. Thank you for being there. I pray for everyone who's connected from around the world, for those who are sick, for those who have economical needs. I pray for the church, River Church, that army of the living Lord, this squad, this seeks lost souls for the Lord. The Lord loves you, River Church. I pray for the children 
Spirit, for the youth, for everyone in River Arena, plus those who are going to add up to our family, those who are part of our family virtually now. I bless you. I release upon you the Holy Spirit with a new anointing. May the Lord bless you when you go in, when you go out, when you get up, when you go to bed. May His face shine upon you, and may your face shine with His presence. May God give you abundant blessings. Amen and amen. God bless you. May God keep you safe. We'll see you within seven days. Be strong and firm. Thank you for being there. I'm happy to transmit what God put in my heart for you. Don't get angry with me. I'm just a mailman. <laughs> Goodbye. See you next time. See you next Sunday. Bye. Abandonado y perdido te reconocí Tu voz diciendo menos temas Yo estoy aquí El Padre me envió por ti Y me curaste las heridas Me sanaste en mi Jesús Todas mis cargas las dejaste allí en la cruz Algo tan grande no lo puedo comprender Oigo tu dulce voz diciéndome una y otra vez Oh, oh, oh Perdido te reconocí Tu voz diciéndome no temas Yo estoy aquí El Padre me envió por ti Y me curaste las heridas Me sanaste mi Jesús Todas mis cargas las dejaste allí en la cruz